need to uh, to dim the lights or something uh, to get this thing uh, started tonight. We are very fortunate to have on our faculty these past this quarter and the winter quarter, Sonny Palmer, and we're very fortunate to have him lecturing tonight, showing some of his work. Sonny uh, graduated uh, in 1963 from Texas A&M. He uh, got a master's degree from uh, Columbia University. He has practiced uh, with uh, a practice consisting of uh, many large-scale buildings, starting with his work with Harrison and Abramovitz in 1963. He has uh, lectured at uh, Cal Poly and Cornell and has served as the faculty for some 30 professional seminars across the country. He is, uh, has co-authored uh, uh, one of our most authoritative books on uh, space design. He has, uh, has taught fourth year design for the college these past two years. We're very fortunate to have the opportunity to get a look at his work tonight. Sonny Palmer. Uh, thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> One of the nice things about Charlie is he doesn't exaggerate. <laughs> um, There are two things that I would like to do tonight. And um, the second thing I would like to do is <clears throat> show a few slides of um, uh, various projects that have been done over a period of time, um, projects that I consider to be both good and bad. But each of the projects, for some reason or another, uh, have some point that I think might be of interest uh, to the group here. And the first thing I would like to do is uh, tell a story. And uh, the story is related to the from zero to sixty in five years. And it's a story of how the design of the U.S. Department of Labor Building came about. I think probably to tell the story it would be worth starting at the very beginning. Um, I was working in New York City um, in the mid-60s, and one Friday night I was at a cocktail party, and sometime around midnight I got a phone call, and it was uh, an architect that I had known some years before in Texas, and the person asked me if it was possible for me to come to Washington, Washington, D.C., the next day that he and his colleagues wanted to talk to me about opening an office for them in Washington, D.C., uh, specifically for the design of the labor building. Well, I said, fine, you know, I'd be happy to meet you. And anyway, to make a long story short, I did go to Washington the next day, and we worked out our arrangements. but. On the way to Washington, it occurred to me, how in the world did he find me at this cocktail party? And uh, so I asked, and his answer was simply, well, we have our ways. Uh, I was in Washington, I guess, for seven or eight years, and uh, the uh, answer, we have our ways, kept coming up time and time again, and will come up during this presentation um, related to the, to the labor building. Thank you. What I'd, what I'd like to talk about, basically, is why it took five years to put this thing together. Uh, after moving to Washington and putting together a small team of, 
uh, architects to um, design the labor building, um, we actually started uh, with a description of the site. And um, what, the, what the story is, is that uh, GSA, General Services Administration, had two sites for the labor building. One was outside of the downtown area or outside of the governmental mall area. Uh, labor was not the least bit happy with having uh, a cabinet level building or offices located away from the other government building. So we were asked to look at uh, a particular site in the downtown or the mall area to see if we could put a building there. So, um, Bob, which of these buttons do I push? Okay. So we were asked to look at this particular site, the one in the, this color here. As you can see, it's on Constitution Avenue. This is the Capitol building. Uh, these are two uh, Washington, D.C. Or, or local government buildings. Um, and these are various buildings to either side. This one here happens to be uh, the Teamsters Union building. Um, but you can see that it's a very prestigious location. And we saw the site and we said, well, uh, why is it necessary that we should uh, go to the trouble to find out if we can put a building there? It looks like a fantastic site to us. Uh, the answer was, well, uh, there's some limitations. For instance, uh, this building here is tied up in a trust fund. Uh, it's belonged to a certain family for something like three generations, and uh, we can't uh, remove it. It's a building about, oh, five or six stories high. And uh, this particular project here, or building here, uh, looks like an office building. It's about six stories high. It has windows like an office building, but it's really a service station. And um, on the ground level, they pump gas and grease cars. And in the upper levels that look like offices, they actually uh, park the cars. And you can't possibly uh, get rid of that building because uh, that's where the congressmen drop their cars off to have them washed. And uh, they don't want to give that building up. The building happened to belong to Exxon. And they said, besides that, uh, there's a proposed freeway under this building, um, which at this point has 15 lanes of traffic. And um, so the building must go over that. And in addition to that, the building must house the ventilation to ventilate a tunnel underneath the mall. So that's why you're doing a feasibility study. So we started out on the five-year trip um, to study the first feasibility study to see if a project could be built on that particular site. And the questions that we had to answer in the feasibility study were, uh, can we actually put a building on the site that would house all of labor's uh, programs? And incidentally, at that time, labor was uh, scattered throughout the middle portion of Washington, D.C. in 18 different buildings. And the second question was, can uh, such a building house the ventilation equipment for a freeway, uh, for a freeway tunnel? So we put together a small team consisting of ourselves, the architects, structural mechanical engineers, freeway engineers, soils engineers, etc. And spent something like uh, five months looking at the possibility of locating a building on that particular site. Now, I think the government really expected us, <coughs> pardon me, to come back with uh, a, a positive answer saying, yes, we, you can build a building here. But our answer uh, didn't come out quite that way. It came out that, yes, we can build a building over the freeway. Uh, however, 
we do not believe that you can house all of labor's programs in that building and maintain uh, the continuity of that section of Washington as far as scale and the relationship to the building surroundings are concerned. And no, you cannot house the ventilation equipment for all of the tunnel, but yes, we could house the ventilation for half of the tunnel. So, what happened was they agreed that it was reasonable to separate the tunnel somewhere in the middle of the mall. And um, while we started working on the north end of the, of the tunnel project, Breuer and his group started working on the south end uh, in the building that is now the Humphrey building or the HEW Annex. So we started on the design. Uh, but almost immediately, we were told that uh, we have our ways, and consequently, Exxon has decided to give up their building. And sure enough, they uh, sold the building to the government and uh, actually located a service station somewhere nearby. Now. We, didn't, we don't know just how that was accomplished, but uh, as I said, Washington has its ways, and Exxon, as big as they are, decided to move out. So we started with this particular site, and um, we were given, in addition to the, the site we started with, this little piece up here so that we could actually supposedly house more of labor's programs. Uh, and we started studying that particular site, and I'll go through these quickly because the story gets complicated. Um, and from the outset, we weren't the least bit happy with uh, the kind of project that was being, uh, that was taking form here. I might mention, incidentally, that this model you see um, <coughs> is an all plexiglass model which we built for under a separate contract for uh, GSA. If you look at it closely you can probably see that there are some breakpoints in different places. The entire model comes apart. Each block comes out, each building comes off of each block, and then the model which is, I don't remember the size, uh, 15 by 20, something like that, uh, literally comes all apart and it's used for any projects in Washington for, um, it's actually loaned to architects to use for projects done in this particular area of the city. In any case, um, as I say, with uh, the office building sitting there, trying to wrap around it, uh, we just could not seem to uh, form a design that uh, we were happy with. So in the process, um, the government said, well, we now have this small piece of property and we're going to swap this one for this one. And I might mention that Victor Lundy had been doing a small building here and uh, he was given this site. Uh, so Victor and my group started over again. So our site became something like this, and then all of a sudden, uh, that building disappeared. Even though it had been in the family for something like three generations, Washington has its ways, and uh, all of a sudden our site looked like this. So we started out again, trying to put a building on this particular uh, configuration without, uh, without that uh, small office building. And again, we weren't happy with it. But uh, I guess maybe we were a little slow, uh, but we started getting wise, I guess. We, we decided, what the heck? Uh, 
if Washington has its ways, why don't we extend the site and get something we can really deal with? So we said, we want this piece of property over here as well. And uh, much to our surprise, within something like two weeks, we were given that site. Um, so we said, well, that's great. And uh, <coughs> actually started at that point putting together um, the project as it appears today. And uh, in describing that, I would like to more or less start at uh, the beginning or with some of the fundamentals. You can see this the shape of the site. And uh, well, but let me explain first. We put together a team which consisted of our own architectural group, um, Larry Halperin and his group out of San Francisco were landscape consultants, Seymour Evans out of New York for lighting, Bolt Baranek and Unum um, out of Cambridge for acoustical, Lockwood Andrews and Newnham out of Houston for structural mechanical building uh, specialties, uh, McKeon Berger, New York cost consultants, Dames and Moore, Soils engineers, uh, Robert Kahn out of Long Island for kitchen. Freeway engineers were David Volkert and Associates, and the tunnel ventilation engineers were um, Severed and Parcel out of St. Louis. It's probably also worth mentioning in tackling a project like this, and we're talking about a project that has in the range of 100, I'm sorry, one and a quarter million square feet. Um, remember it has 15 lanes of traffic under it. Uh, and the cost on it, we don't really know. Uh, we never were given the final figure, but it ran considerably in excess of uh, $125 million. Now, because of the complexity of this project, which you'll see in a moment, we, we felt that it was necessary that this team have total access to each other. So consequently, in our office in Washington, uh, all of the key members from the team had actual workplaces. And in each of their offices in the different cities, we had workplaces. So consequently, uh, at any time, we could move from one office to another and work on whatever problems were at hand. I think it goes without saying, we spent more time in San Francisco and Cambridge than we did in Houston, but nevertheless, uh, we did go back and forth. <clears throat> one of the other unique things about working in Washington is you don't really have one client, but you have a whole slew of clients. Um, the building was for labor, so consequently they had to pass judgment on it. Uh, GSA is the construction arm of the federal government, so they had to approve it. The fact that the freeway was under it meant that the Bureau of Public Roads also had a say in the building. And as you remember in the last um, site expansion step, we were on to the District of Columbia land, so all of a sudden they had a say in it. Uh, Commission of Fine Arts has a say on anything built in downtown Washington. The National Capital Planning Commission is the planning branch of the, um, for the District of Columbia, so they had a say. There was a special commission set up for Pennsylvania Avenue, and the fact that this was on Pennsylvania Avenue, they had a say in it. And the Capitol architect, even though it was not on the Capitol grounds, it was deemed by Congress that it was close enough that he should have a say in the building. So consequently, uh, rather than one client, we had however many of those are, eight, I believe. And um, for you students that haven't worked with clients yet, to have one is enough, but to have eight is unbelievable. 
The concept for the building was very simple, or is very simple. It's just simply three rectangles. Um, looking at a section, um, the spaces were divided uh, basically the dining at the upper level, offices, and it is basically an office building, um, were toward the middle, public spaces um, at ground level, and um, parking tucked in around the uh, tunnel, the tunnel obviously, and then just above the tunnel, and you'll see how this works in a moment, um, were the archives. Structure of the building, and if you want to count those, I believe there are 359 columns, um, was basically a very simple 30 by 30 module with some variations. In the center here, these became 30 by 35, where the dashed lines are here, and here the module broke down again because this was where the city street went under and on this side this was where the freeway exit came out of the building. But the structure was more complex than that obviously with um, the freeway beneath it. So what you're seeing here are a series of 70 feet long girders, each one of these. Two rows of them spanning the main portion of the freeway and then these small, smaller girders span the city street and again the exit coming uh, from beneath the building, freeway, the freeway exit. So you have a situation something like this. You have the main structure of the building basically 30 by 30 coming down on girders which are 70 feet long. They in turn carry the weight on down into uh, foundations and then floating in here uh, beneath the girders but totally separate, I mean completely isolated from the structure of the building is the freeway bed and that portion of the freeway uh, or, or the ceiling for the freeway tunnel. Um, in Washington, there is a water table that is not too far under the surface. In fact, uh, in the center of the mall, um, it's only a few feet under the surface. So consequently, this chunk of concrete here at different points, and remember it's 60 feet wide, uh, was up to 18 feet deep. And the only reason for that was just simply to keep it in the ground. The girders going across here, according to the computer, said all we need was something like six feet to span and span the distance and carry the loads. But what we decided is if we increase the depth of that, and we decided on 12 feet, we could actually use that space. And it's in that space that the archives were placed. So consequently, there is a floor laid in here, ceiling in here. There's a conveyor system that goes through the hole in the center of the, of the uh, girder. Uh, and the conveyor system goes all through the building so that consequently, at any time, anyone can receive a document within 10 minutes from the archives. Parking uh, is in a strip on 4th Street and in a block on 3rd Street. There are 900 parking places in the building. The enclosure at Ground Plain uh, looks like this. So what's happening here is this is 4th Street, goes underneath the building. There's an entry at this point. The main entry for the building is here around the fountain and into this area. This particular public space uh, houses, um, meeting rooms, conference rooms. In fact, uh, the, the discussions concerning the coal strike 
just a few weeks ago, all took place in this space. Uh, down in this area, um, and spreading out to either side of this, are a museum, um, an exhibit area, um, and various types of public uh, spaces that are totally related to the public. At this end, on Constitution Avenue, is a ceremonial entrance. Um, and this whole area is designed in such a way that when parades are held on this strip, uh, people can gather in this area and watch the parades. Now, the parking garage is under here, one of the parking garages. And in this area, and you'll see some slides of it in a few minutes, um, is completely burned and has become a very private space, which is now a daycare center for the people working in the Department of Labor building. <coughs> Looking at the roof plan, uh, it's very similar. Again, a very simple building uh, with a link across the top that ties uh, the two rectangles together. A section through the building from north to south. Uh, this is a road bed, the heavy portion. Uh, the girders, and you can see they step up as it goes, as the site steps up from south to north. Uh, the public space through here, offices, and in uh, the background or in elevation the actual dining facilities. Looking at it the other way, uh, again, the roadbed, etc. And I mentioned that the ventilation system for the tunnel had to be housed here. Uh, there are 10 of these fans, some supplying fresh air, some exhausting air out of the tunnels. Uh, statistically, each of the rotors in each of these fans are 12 feet in diameter and weigh 12 and a half tons, just the rotors. So I'll give you some idea of the kind of mass that has to be dealt with in designing a tunnel. Now we started, again remembering the number of clients we had, we started putting this project together. And we made some decisions early in the project. One is simply because the, the building is so near the Capitol um, and because of its incredible size, we decided early on that we wanted it to be a low profile and background building. And we set out to try to accomplish that. And obviously, in designing something this size, the, the process gets to be complex. And what I'd like to do for just a moment is show some of the studies that took place during the design process. These are mass models, sketches, obviously. Now, this one's worth mentioning because the statue here, Albert Pick, whoever that is, um, in Washington, there is a lot of old statuary, uh, but unfortunately, it's incredibly hard to hold on to. And especially if a piece is removed, uh, it usually never ends up back where uh, you might want it. So again, uh, we had to rely on, we have our ways to hang on to that piece because, uh, quite honestly, you just can't get that kind of stuff anymore. And you'll see an actual slide of that in a moment. Um, some more studies of the actual building. Uh, the main entry or the, the working entrance to the project. <clears throat> more detail mass models. Um, the actual freeway as it goes beneath the building. Uh, 
And as you can see, we worked very hard because we knew these two buildings were going to be here forever, probably. So this space in here became very important. In fact, our design took this space and carried it all the way down here for a block. Unfortunately, that has never been done, although the design is completed for it. Um, again, on a project this size, the rhythm and the massing, the detail of the building became incredibly important. So it was studied uh, not only in model form like this, but also in uh, full-scale mock-ups of certain areas. Again, the rhythm of the building, as I said, was very important to us. So, we got the thing together and we were very happy about it. Um, for what it's worth, uh, this particular building, up until that time, uh, and I'm not sure it's I'm not sure if the record holds, but up until that time, this was the only project that was presented to the Fine Arts Commission one time and it was approved. No other project before had ever pulled that off. So with that approval and the approval from the other clients, we were tickled to death and uh, about to go on to other things when Secretary Wirtz decided that it would be a very good political thing to call in all the leaders of the various labor uh, unions and make a presentation to them because in a sense it was their building. So he did that. In came everyone from George Meany to Walter Ruther to Hoffa to Woodcock and on and on. There were about 60 or 70 people at the meeting. We made our presentation, which George Meany slept through. Uh, and after we were through, he woke up and said something to uh, something like this. Uh, well, I feel that since the labor building represents uh, uh, the working people of this country, that is extremely important that uh, the actual working spaces be uh, as contemporary and as uh, humanized as possible. Well, as you know, when George speaks, you listen. So anyway, the meeting broke up and we all went home and uh, late that night, I got a call from Secretary Wirtz, and he said, I want you in my office in the morning at 9 o'clock. And I said, yes, sir, I'll be there. So next morning at 9 o'clock, I was there, and I, uh, I uh, sat down, and he said, I want, he said, I need to ask you some things. He said, first of all, what do you know about office landscaping or bureau lawn shaft? And I said, well, I've heard about it, but I really don't know anything about it. And he said, well, since our meeting yesterday, he said, I've looked into it a little bit. And he said, I think it's something we better know about. He said, how quickly can you leave for Europe? And I said, well, you know, my passport's out of date. Don't worry, we can take care of that. And that was a Tuesday, as I remember. And on Friday, I was on my way to Europe uh, and toured uh, most of the installations that were uh, completed at that time, talked with the various architects and planners that had done the various projects, came back, made a report, uh, which led to another feasibility study. Um, basically to see what, uh, or to tell the government, to be more correct, what office landscaping is all about. Now, the, uh, the extent of the feasibility study really compared conventional to open, and I don't want to spend time on this, 
Uh, the results, though, were published in um, a brochure, actually a small book, with this title. The first edition was printed by the government printing office. Uh, for some reason, it became such a popular item that we were given permission to print up through the fifth edition. And ironically, that was uh, almost ten years ago. I'm still getting requests for this uh, uh, piece of information or, or small book, even though it's out of date and for all practical purposes uh, has no validity at this time. But out of the feasibility study came several recommendations. One was to actually study a group of the Department of Labor and see if uh, to really test out this thing called open planning or bureau lawn shaft. So we started on what has become known as the Odcaso test research installation. Now what we did was we took uh, a group within labor, the Office of Data Collection and Survey Operations, who were housed in one of the 18 locations I mentioned. This old building was built in the uh, late 40s, as I remember, um, and put together a team of various disciplines in a planning office located across the street in this building. Now, I'm showing all these buildings to lead up to this one. Um, this is the old pension building, and I just show it because at that particular time it was full of bats and um, a few offices on the first floor, some incredible old furniture up in the top portions of it. And since that time, the Smithsonian has taken it over and renovated it, and it's well worth seeing. It's a building built uh, just after the Civil War, and the interior of the building is all open. It's completely open. It's all gardens inside. The entire roof, uh, at least the center portion of the roof, is skylight. In any case, we started planning for a group of people that were housed in offices like this. And this is not uncommon in Washington, for those of you who have been there. But anyway, Odcaso was located, these are actual photographs of their working space, um, and again, I don't want to go into a, a discussion about open planning and office landscaping, but in the process of studying this, um, we obviously built models and models and more models, uh, studying the relationships, the spaces, uh, details of the spaces. And even though these slides are off color, uh, this was the actual space that the people moved into. Now remember, this was a test installation. Um, at this particular time, there was no open plan furniture in this country. No one was making it. Uh, so what we did is we put together a set of specifications which uh, the Federal Supply Service, that wing of the government that buys furniture, uh, called salient feature specifications and sent the uh, items out for contract and uh, what we got back was a bunch of garbage to be honest with you. All the tables were made by an outfit called AMCO in um, St. Louis. What they make are casings for shotgun shells but they saw this ad in the Commerce Daily or wherever the government advertises and decided what the heck we can build a desk as well as anyone so they built these desks and uh, if you were to visit this space today you <laughs> the desks are literally falling apart. The baffled ceiling is related to acoustical control of the space. Um, the chairs are off government uh, standards. The acoustical screens uh, were made by a firm in Michigan. Um, one of the things that came out of this project 
Um, and you can see over here at the windows, working with Louver Drape in Santa Monica, we developed a, uh, an acoustical vertical blind. Um, it was one of the things that came out of, one of the new products, let's say, that came out of this project because if you have drapes in an open plan, if you open them, the sound bounces off the window, so you have a problem. If you close the drapes, obviously you can't see out, even though you can control the uh, bounce of sound. So the introduction of acoustical blinds, which you can both see out of and at the same time control sound, seemed to be a reasonable thing, and they were developed and used in this particular space. One of the other things we looked at were related to both communications and uh, status and what we're really talking about here is the little box on the top of the acoustical screen no big thing you say but on the other hand uh, at that time there were a lot of complaints about people getting lost in open plans so we put together a series of these using the odd castle symbol uh, and people's names, etc. Herman Miller still makes these, by the way. So if you want one, you can get it, complete with your name and logo. Um, now, we come to the end of this portion of it, and that is after the installation, the test research installation was completed and the testing incidentally went on for something like two years after the completion testing of not only the physical space but also incredible detailed psychological studies into how the people reacted to the space um, test of efficiency and productivity and on and on and on in any case we wrapped up uh, the design of this project and I probably should mention that uh, while the design was going on, um, production was also going on also because the project was phased. And uh, the lower portions of the building were built with the uh, remainder of the project completed later. Now this is a uh, slide of some of the girders under construction. You can see the opening uh, through the center of them. <clears throat> there are three of them that are visible here and again in addition to being able to walk through here there's a conveyor system that runs the entire length of the project and wraps through the building so the building today and it was completed this past summer uh, looks like this. This is from the intersection of Pennsylvania and Constitution. Uh, the public entry. Looking out from the negotiation area back down toward the area that we wanted to be completely landscaped and become a small mini mall. Incidentally, uh, both cars and people traverse this same area with no problems. <clears throat> and I mention that because uh, I know in some of my classes uh, there's always a tendency to try to separate automobiles and people. And uh, it's my very strong feeling it's not always necessary. Uh, this is the area that uh, I mentioned is becoming a... Um, daycare center as you can see the grass has not uh, completely grown in here yet this piece of sculpture by Tony Smith uh, is to the east side of the project actually we had wanted to put in a piece of sculpture by Alfredo Allegra South American sculptor Unfortunately, uh, the piece that he had done was purchased by the Baltimore Museum of Modern Art, and uh, 
to this day I'm sorry that it was not located here because it was actually located it was actually designed for this space and as I said good old Albert Pick And the one thing we always knew was that someday you'd be able to sit in the Secretary of Labor's office and look at the Capitol building. And if you look very closely, you can see it in the background there. Unfortunately, and these things happen with changes in administration, the building is not open plan, only very small portions of it. Um, but as I say, there doesn't seem to be much that uh, can be done about that. Now I mentioned that uh, I would like to talk about a few other projects and uh, what I've done is selected uh, several which for one reason or another I think are worth mentioning. Starting first with a project that was done when I was a student at uh, Columbia it's an actually a project for the Camden, New Jersey School Board. <coughs> and the project uh, was, was actually built as designed. It was a prototype school um, to be located on a city block in Camden. Um, and it was in a particular neighborhood where all of the uh, buildings there had basements. So after removing the basements, uh, the building was actually dropped into uh, the hole and bridges tied the street level to the actual classroom spaces. So while I flip through a few of these, I'd like to mention that as we all know, most student projects do not get built. And it was only because of a fluke that this particular one uh, was built. And the reason primarily, I think, is that the architect in Camden that was given the contract for this project was extremely insecure design-wise, so consequently he didn't want to take any chances. This thing had been published in several magazines and Ford Foundation was behind it and so forth. Um, he didn't want to take any chances so he put the construction documents together precisely the way the design was put together and uh, it got built. <coughs> In fact, uh, there were actually two of them built first one was a prototype, the second one when a few changes were made in and the design was repeated. Now, to look at the other side of the coin, also while a student at Columbia, I did a project for the Riverdale Day School in Yonkers. Uh, and quite honestly, it did not get built. Uh, and the reason was that Charles Colbert was given the contract for it and to say Charles Colbert is insecure about his design <laughs> would be stretching a point. So he threw this thing out and designed his own project. I'm happy to say it did not get built either. <coughs> this is a project outside of uh, Washington near Reston. Uh, it's an interiors project for Mars Company. I show this only basically for one thing. Uh, as I say, it's, it's an interiors project. Mars Company is one of the largest family-owned corporations in the world. Um, and these slides were taken before the project was completed. What I wanted to show you were these things. These are called jiffy poles or service poles. It was one of the first projects in the country. I'm not sure it was the first, but certainly one of the first, in which these were used in a project. And what they're for is bringing both telephone and electrical service down to the desktop. Another unique thing about this project, um, we convinced the Mars brothers that uh, 
what they should do is give each employer a certain amount of money and let them go out and purchase whatever kind of art they wanted, put it in the space, and let the rest of the people in the office decide whether it should stay or not. Much to our surprise, they gave each employee $3,000 and told them to go buy uh, whatever they wanted. Uh, the pieces are not in here at the moment, but I think you can imagine uh, the space comes alive with the art objects added. The Seidel project in Austin, uh, again, it's mentioned because uh, it's the first building in which uh, General Services Administration gave money to a private developer to build a building to house one of uh, the government agencies. And CEDL is the Southwest Educational Development Laboratory. It's a learning center located in, in I'm sorry, in Austin. So uh, I thought this might be worth showing just for that reason. It's a very inexpensive building on an incredibly tight site. These uh, items here are the acoustical vertical blinds again. And I'm happy to say that Aramco did not make the furniture in this space. I guess every architect does uh, moonlight work. And uh, this particular small project in Vermont was that sort of thing. Unfortunately, I can say without a doubt, it's the worst client I ever had. Uh, it was a fellow that was about 22, who at the age of 21 inherited $35 million and I uh, was looking everywhere for places to invest that money but uh, and actually bought a big chunk of this ski resort uh, but he just would not do anything other than dictate everything that uh, took place not only design wise but uh, is unbelievable he was on the site every day with a the construction workers drove them crazy uh, and the result is that uh, the thing did not pan out the way he thought so he was originally going to build something like uh, 300 houses he ended up building 25. Another client in Osceola, Texas uh, was one of those people that uh, turned out to be a very good client. That is, you can have free reign, do what you like, um, just solve our problems. So this project, uh, again, uh, well, I, I should say that <laughs> the client is a good one. Unfortunately, the person was in uh, the construction business, so this project has been put on the shelf for a couple of years now. But Hopefully it will go ahead this summer. It's a unique project in that uh, the complex is for a family uh, that includes four generations. So there are actually 12 separate living areas in the complex for the different members of this one family. It's located on a large, flat area southwest of Dallas. <clears throat> I think any architect should show at least one project they're completely ashamed of. So I've put this one in. Um, this is a project uh, that I did right after graduate, out of being out of graduate school at Harrison Abramovich. 
It's a project, obviously, at Radcliffe College. Unfortunately, the family that gave the money for this had just come back from Japan or someplace and dictated, literally dictated the design. And so, in the middle of Cambridge, you have this. Uh, Quite honestly, I don't think it'd look good anywhere, but uh, in Cambridge, it's really out of place. I did what I could to hide it with plants, but they didn't grow big enough. Um, shortly after that, a second project, also in Cambridge, again at Radcliffe College. Um, and in this case, uh, better possibilities of, of design. I might mention that these represent the quadrangle houses. These white spaces represent courtyards. Consequently, uh, what you will see is some courtyards are up and some are down. But the point is that this particular project, in my opinion, does fit in Cambridge and certainly uh, fits within the fabric of that section of the city. This is one of the lower courtyards. <clears throat> and a series of fences around the project. And I think probably the best detail I ever did. The last thing I would like to show you is a series of furniture designed for a firm in Michigan. Um, it's open plan furniture. It's all in wood, or basically all in wood, uh, for uh, open plan offices. These are the desk, two, very, uh, two uh, different sizes, um, typing tables both a two and four modulo, modular low credenza, <coughs> a four modular high credenza, and that's a tax space on the upper portion. The bookshelves are removable and can be replaced with uh, flipper doors, etc. cetera. Uh, in the foreground, a two module, and the back side of the uh, four module unit, that is all acoustical, um, are the, the back side of all of these units carry the same acoustical treatment as a visual acoustical screen. Some of the detailing, conference tables, chairs, bookshelves, lateral files, uh, the acoustical screens that are used for separation and uh, open plans detailing again, some of the chairs. And with that, that completes um, this presentation. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? question is, uh, is the building energy conscious? Um, I think if you look closely at it, you'll see that the glass is reset, so recessed. So consequently, while there's a very high percentage of glass, the percentage of glass that actually has sunshine on it is considerably low. And I don't remember what that percentage is, but it's lower than it might appear because there is an exceptionally deep recess. Yeah. 
did I understand is does a freeway affect the building? Is that sound wise? Um, the answer is no. Although, I, to be honest with you, uh, right when the people first moved in, there was a problem, and it took us a little time to find out what the problem was. Uh, what it amounted to was specifications for the roadbed of the freeway were to be continuous and uninterrupted. And uh, we found one flaw in the roadbed which set up a vibration, and as you probably know, vibration can translate into sound uh, after it travels up through a structure. But that was, after we found where the problem was, uh, that was corrected. So the answer is no. That's, you can't even tell it's there. Well, we thank you very much. Thank you.